Today's message is going to be very simple. It's from the Bible. I hope you learn something. I hope you're encouraged. And I hope it'll make you seek more about the things of God. Thanks again for tuning in. But that is where we are going to start, is uh, James chapter 2, uh, verse 14. And it says this, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Amen to that. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as always, thank you for the message that is about to be preached. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to even be here in your house and to worship and to learn more about you. Lord, please be with our senior pastor as he delivers this message to the Bride of Christ. It is titled, The Facets of Faith. And so I, I'm excited about this word, Lord, that you have given to Pastor Jeff. And uh, we, are, we are just excited to be here, especially during this Christmas season, Lord. We want to be a church that um, is just focused on the birth of Christ, as I said last weekend, and not the commercialism that the world has turned Christmas into. Um, and so we are excited for that right now, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So church... Um we're doing an Advent, we're doing, <laughs> we have an Advent wreath here at the church. Now we talked about this last week, I'm just going to kind of recap for those folks who are new tonight. Advent is a time, a, a time of the church uh, uh, that uh, we recognize the various portions of the Christmas story and the four weeks leading up to Christmas Day, uh, each Sunday represents a particular part of that story. And uh, we talked about last week was the, um, remember that what it was last week? Can you take, anyone tell me? Prophet. The prophet's candle, that's right. We lit the prophet's candle last week. And of course, the prophets were those who told in advance the things that uh, Messiah was going to do and be and all that. We looked at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. By the way, he did a great job on uh, reciting that. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus ever landed there, came and or was said that he was going to be Messiah. Tonight, we're going to light what's called the Bethlehem candle. Now, why is Bethlehem important? Bethlehem tells us in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, again, the Old Testament, that Bethlehem is where the Messiah is going to be born. Uh, and, uh, and that is a prophecy, again, way in advance before Jesus ever came. It's part of the Christmas story because, again, all of the prophecies of the Old Testament, the prophecies pertaining to Jesus Christ, were indeed fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So tonight we light the Bethlehem candle as another part of the Advent season, and we celebrate the fact that when God says something, He means it. Amen? Amen. Of course, the candles we get here from China don't work, but that's okay. <laughs> there we go. It's going to go. Hey, let's have a word of prayer before we go any further. Father, I pray that you teach us here tonight to understand and to, and to rejoice in the fact that, that Advent... Uh, in itself is not the important, it's all the representation and all the symbolism of each Sunday looking forward to the arrival, that's what Advent means, the arrival of Messiah, of Jesus Christ who would come and take away the sins of the world. So Father, we remember the prophets last week, we remember Bethlehem playing an integral part in your plan, and we look forward to all you're going to teach us here tonight. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So as Brother Harry said, tonight's passage is right out of James chapter 2. Now, I actually taught part of this text in our James study. We have a James study every Wednesday at 10 o'clock. And we looked at James chapter 2. Uh, and it was actually, I think it was actually, let me see, um, 18 uh, through uh, I can't remember anyway, but I, I really felt like it was important for us to look at this as a church because uh, we talk a lot about faith, don't we? The 
Faith, I got faith. You got to have faith on and on and on. And uh, all of the Old Testament prophecies had to be received by faith because faith is an integral part of our belief structure. Faith is believing in something that you can't necessarily touch or feel like that. You just believe it and hold to it. I heard a story one time about three farmers that would go out every day into the field. They'd been dealing with a drought for a year. And they would go out in that field and they would get down on their knees and they would hold their hands up and call for God to bring water to, to, to rain on that land that they had around there. They just wanted water so bad. Well, this uninvited guest comes walking up and sees these three farmers you know, calling out to God. And he says, what are y'all doing? I said, well, we're praying for rain. And, and this guy says, not going to happen. They said, what do you mean it's not going to happen? We come out here every day and, and we call on the Lord and we ask him to, to bring rain down here. Our crops are, are never going to survive. We don't get rain. He says, I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. The second farmer looked at him and says, what do you mean it's not going to happen? We're, we're faithful. We do all this on a regular basis. We just got to believe that God's going to do this. He says, I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. The third farmer says, so, so what would you do? What would you do? We're, we're doing this. We think we're doing everything we're supposed to be. You say we're not going to happen. What would you do differently? And the guy looked at him, he says, if I was praying, I'd have already brought my umbrella. Now, that wasn't funny, but the point there is, you can pray for something, but if you don't pray with faith, then do you really believe that it's going to take place? Faith is an important part of the Christian walk. James is talking to the church, the early church. James probably is the oldest book in the New Testament. James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, was teaching the early church about the importance of, uh, of like not showing favoritism. You see, the early church had Gentiles and Jews, and, and the Jewish part of, of the church that was practicing both Judaism and Christianity, really confusing. James, trying to clear all, James is trying to clear all that up. Uh, but he was, he was trying to tell them, first of all, you guys are showing favoritism to some people, and you're not caring for everybody in the church. But then he begins to teach them something that they were dealing with. They, they believed, and I believe, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, we are saved by grace through faith, and I'm going to explain that in just a few minutes. But they believed that because they had faith, they no longer had to act on that faith by doing deeds of service and showing love in a practical way. Now, I call this facets of faith. If you ask any 21-year-old woman what a facet is, she will tell you that's a diamond. That's a diamond, and that's not coming up. Why is that not coming up? Pat? Pat? Why is this not working? It is on. There we go, finally. That's good. So a diamond has got little facets. i got a little diagram here. Each one of those flat parts of that diamond is a facet. And you know what happens there. Light comes through, hits each one of those things. Yeah, I've got a young girl here in the thing. You're, so you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You not only know what a facet is, you know what a carrot is too, don't you? That's right, absolutely. And I don't know a woman around that doesn't have that thing down like, what a rock. Yeah, but I've used this as an example because each one of those flat surfaces allows light to hit, and then it refracts down through the diamond, and that's where you get your sparkle from. Well, there are three basic facets, three different faces, if you will, of faith in this particular text tonight. But I want to emphasize that we're not saved by faith. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. Now, what does that mean? The grace of God, God's unmerited favor, we haven't earned it, we can't do enough to be saved. God says, I'm going to receive you as my child by your faith. I'm giving you my grace, and because you put your faith in me, I am going to save you. He says, it's not of works, or it's not of yourself, it's nothing that you're able to do. It's a gift from God. Not by your effort, not by your action, not by that. None of that can get you saved. It's a gift from God. He says, because if we could, back, if we could, uh, could use our works to uh, get saved, then we'd sit around and brag about it. That's what that text actually means. But I also point you to a text out of the book of Acts, Acts 17. 
The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he, does not, he, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. So again, we're saved by grace and sustained. Oops, gracious. Sustained. Yeah, I'm going to get dancing up here. I'm looking almost charismatic for a second there. Um, and he gives us everything that we need. Once we come to know him as Lord and Savior, he provides for everything that we need. So the facets of faith are explained in these particular texts. The first thing, I, well, I also want to point out this out as well. Because some folks say, well, how do you define faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 actually defines it for us. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for. Now, what is it that we hope for? Not like we wish, like, oh, wish I wait, wish I might, wish I wish the wish tonight. No, the hope that we have is that eternal life. That we are certain of that assurance of eternal life that began at the moment of salvation and will be fulfilled when we go to be in heaven. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, or sure of what we hope for, and certain of what we do not see. We can't see the face of God. We we may encounter him, but we don't see the face of God. We've never looked at Jesus, and yet we still believe by faith. Those are important verses for us to hold on to. So what are the facets of faith? Well, based on what Brother Harry just read, the first facet of faith is what I call dead faith. Why do I call it that? Because James calls it that. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters? So who is he talking to there? He's talking to the church. He says, what good is it, brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? In other words, they say they have faith, but they don't do anything to express that faith. Can such faith save him? Some verses say, can faith save him? But really what it's saying there is, can that kind of faith, an empty faith that never acts on what they believe, that kind of faith, he says, is dead. Suppose a brother or sister, so again, somebody that's in the church is without food or clothing, and you say, peace be with you. That's one translation. Mine happens to say here, go in peace, keep warm, and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is that faith? He says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is a dead faith. Now, what do we know about a dead faith? Dead faith loves to talk. They love to talk. They love to talk about giving to missions. They love to talk about this, that, and the other within the church. They love to give it all kinds of action. They love to talk about all the opportunities that are afforded us through the church. But the fact of the matter, dead faith never gets off their backside and actually participates in anything. James says, if you just tell somebody that's hungry to be well fed and somebody that's naked or cold without a coat or something like that and say, keep warm or have an absolute train wreck of a life and say, ah, go in peace, then my friend, you're just talking. And dead faith loves to talk. They just run their mouth. It's not with our lips that we're supposed to glorify God. It's with our life. Let me give you an example. Jesus himself says, when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans. What are the pagans? The pagans are unbelievers. They'll just keep on hollering certain things. They'll be screaming. I was in a church one night. Everyone was praying in tongues, scared the heck out of me. I didn't know what anybody was saying, and neither did they. And I know what you're saying. Well, wait a minute. They're speaking a language unknown. There's got to be an interpreter when you speak in tongues. That's what the Bible says. And not one person got up and said, okay, here's what we're all saying. They babble like the pagans, thinking that they'll be heard because of their many words. A lot of folks that pray beautiful prayers may not necessarily be a part of the family of God. They look all good on the outside, but the Bible says they are full of dead men's bones. So dead faith loves to talk. But the second thing about dead faith, well, let me give you this, Ephesians 5, uh, 5 verse 7. Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Solomon says, if you just keep on running your mouth, therefore stand in awe of God. Um, therefore stand in awe of God. Many words don't accomplish what God is asking. He wants a pure heart. He wants a, a person that's actually going to call on God. And then as God answers, they're going to act on what God has said. 
But that dead faith just loves to give it lip service and not life service. When we have more time, some folks will say this, when we have more time, more money, and more knowledge, we'll do, we'll do things for God. But can I tell you something? That is nothing more than an excuse. If you wait until you got what you need, sort of like people say, well, when we, when we can afford it, we're going to have a child. <laughs> let, me, let me know how it works out for you. I've had three kids there all in their 30s now, and I still can't afford it. Okay? Just is what it is. But if you say, well, when I have a little bit more time, then I'm going to serve God. Or when I have a little bit more money, I'm going to serve God. And when I get a little bit more knowledge, then I'm going to serve God. I'm telling you, that's just giving talk. That's a dead faith, a faith that never acts. If we think that our current resources are insufficient for God, then we are basically saying that God is not sufficient to work in our lives. I don't want dead faith, do you? No. It loves to talk. But the second thing I'll point out to you about dead faith is that not only does it love to talk, but it lacks tenderness. If you, if you see somebody in the church, one of your brothers and sisters, without clothing or daily food, I was listening to a, a young kid just recently talk about being homeless and, and how he would go three or four or five days without having anything to eat. We would implode if we went through days like that. And that was his life. Came to know Christ later on, pretty cool. But the lack of tenderness, that's really what's happening here. If your guy doesn't do anything for the physical needs, it says there in verse 16, 16, what good is that kind of faith? And I'm telling you, it's not good at all. It lacks the tenderness and the compassion and the caring for the people around it. And again, remember, we're talking about people in the church. For so, it's, why is it so easy for us to go somewhere else and minister to people when we don't even recognize the people we sit to next to Sunday after Sunday. If you walk up to somebody and you go, how are you doing? They go, I'm fine. Oh, good. Glad to hear. <laughs> I'm on my next thing. They're telling you. They're telling you with their look and with their actions that they're hurting. The Bible says those of us who are spiritual need to restore those that are struggling. To lack the tenders, that's dead faith, man. The willingness to kind of say, oh, man, I hope it all works out for you. If you need me, call me. I just told you I needed you. Hello? I hate that phrase. If you need me, give me a call. I'm, I'm hemorrhaging right here, and you've got band-aids, and you're telling me to give you a call? Doesn't make any sense. John Calvin wrote this. He says, if it is faith alone that justifies, and we know that that the grace of God, but faith by, gets through His grace, but by faith that we receive that. And that justifies that we put our faith in Jesus Christ and we are saved. He says, if, faith alone that ju if it is faith alone that justifies, a faith that justifies can never be alone. That's why when you read some of these texts, it says, uh, can, uh, uh, where was the King James? The King James verse. It actually says, uh, by itself or something like that. When it says, what good is it, brother, if a man claims to have faith but without deeds, and it says by itself in the King James. That's what that really means. He says, if you don't have some kind of action to go on with that faith, that faith is dead. Galatians 6.10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Look at this. Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. You know our first mission field is right here? It's the first place that we need to, to meet the needs of folks around us. We had a brother that was coming to our prayer group uh, on Saturday mor or Friday morning there at uh, Livonia Breakfast Club, and he, he was sitting there, and he goes, he goes, man, I need a job. And we said, well, there's actually an ad on our bulletin board here at the church of, of one of our church members whose company is looking for a job. He came up here, got the information, got the job. The church was the place. We have an opportunity every single day to minister to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And yet we'd rather go someplace else. To lack tenderness is to miss the opportunity right before us. What else does Galatians say? Galatians 5, 6. For, it is in, Christ, for in Christ there is either circumcision or uncircumcision. In other words, that whole, that, that the, the Jewish, non-Jewish kind of thing, we're not going to get into all that. Uh, he says it's not the outward expression of belief that's important. Only thing that counts is, is faith expressing itself through love. One more thing here. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. He says some people claim to know God, but their actions, they deny Him. Oh, I love God, but don't ask anything of me. 
They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for anything good. Woo. Didn't mix any words there, did they? Do we lack... You probably say, well, Pastor, you're not being very tender right now. I'm preaching. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes we got to hear it to move on it. And the fact is the matter, there's a lot of folks sitting in church Sunday after Sunday and lack tenderness. And that's dead faith according to what, what James says right there. He says, can that kind of faith save it? Is that, a, is that an indication of a person's salvation? And, and I would tell you no. Real faith... Faith manifests itself in works of righteousness as an offering of love to the Father. We see that in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Can I ask you a question? I got this out of the King James commentary. How many words can fill an empty stomach? Zero. I don't care what you say. It's never going to satisfy the need. And can I tell you something else? If you're... If, if we're, and I keep saying you're, please don't think that I'm just beating you up. I'm beating myself up every day on this kind of stuff. I, pr I study this all week long before I ever brought it to you, and I've been convicted all week long. Just, if we want to share the gospel with somebody, and they're hungry, or, or cold, or alone, they're not going to receive that message. Once we meet their physical needs then they're going to be open to spiritual things. That's what James is trying to say. If we do nothing for someone's physical needs, he said that's indication of a dead faith. Now, as I said, the works, the, the effort isn't what saves us. We're saved by grace through faith. But that salvation that we enjoy should indeed be expressed through service to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Didn't Jesus himself say, I didn't come here to be served. I came here to serve and be a ransom for many. The words of Christ himself. Understand, we've got to attend to the physical needs of folks before they'll ever be willing to hear the gospel. You'll get that later on in the sermon. The second thing, not only is there dead faith, but do you realize there's also what I call demonic faith? Demonic faith. Look what it says right there in verse 18 and 19. Look what it says. But some will say, you have faith and I have deeds. He says, show me your faith without deeds. I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe in there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. What does he mean by that? Well, if you look at Deuteronomy, I didn't put this on your outline. It's on your outline. I didn't put it on the screen. But Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. It, it, with all your strength. This is what's called the Shema. It's recited daily by the Jewish people in their faith. Love is the basis for what we do. The demons are not going to be able to show love. So if someone says, Well, you have faith and I have deeds. That's a backwards thing. Those are supposed to work together, not in opposition to one another. One, one the faith saves you. Deeds are an expression of that faith. Deeds don't save you, but there should be faith tied to that in some form or some fashion. Faith has got to be, and all of that is culminated in love. God says, I'm, that's the first commandment, to love me, and then I'm going to let my love work in and through you. A demon can't do that. What does a demon, a demonic faith do? They trust in their works. And when I say works, I'm talking about their actions, their efforts. Many churches, many mainstream denominations emphasize, you got to work it, you got to work at it, you got to work at it, you got to work it, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to make this happen. You got to have all this effort before God's actually going to love you. That's demonic faith, friends. Demonic faith. Where do I find that? Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. You know what he's saying there? There's a lot of folks that sound all churchy. They say all the right things. They pray all the right prayers. They sing all the right songs and make every sure everybody sees them. Some of those folks are, are not saved. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And what is the will of my Father? To do the work that he called us to do and sent us to do. All Scripture is God-breathed, the Bible says, and, and offered for training and rebuking and correcting that the man and woman of God will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
Not everybody that hollers out God is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Gordon Dahl said this, most middle class Americans worship their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And they just think, well, if I do enough stuff, I'm going to be okay in the eyes of God. And they're walking lockstep right into a devil's hell. And I always ask folks this, when do you know you've done enough to earn your salvation? To which they can never answer. Because you can't do enough. It's impossible. Well, I'm just hoping it's all going to work out. It's not. Because again, work should be a result of your faith and your love for God. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your your mind, your soul, and your strength, and then love your neighbors yourself, just like Jesus says, there's going to be a natural process to serve those around us. They trust in work, but the second thing about demonic faith is they tremble at the word. Oh, let me give you this. I should have pointed this out. 1 John chapter 5, verse, 1, verse 12. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. You say, well, <laughs> that's kind of a simple statement. But that's important, right? Without faith in Christ, you're not saved. And you can work your fingers to the bone until the cows come home. And you're never going to have access to the Father because only through Christ do we have life and life abundantly. Jesus himself said that in John chapter 10, verse 10. I have come to give them life and give it to them abundantly. They trust in work, but second thing here I'll point out to you is that demonic faith trembles at the word. Demonic faith. It says, look, you see, you believe there is one God, good. James says, it's good that you believe there's one God, you know who else believes that? The devil and his demons. And they believe that and shudder. You know why they shudder? Because they know where they're going to end up. As far as I know, the devil believes every word of the Bible. He knows the Bible more and better than you and I do. That's why he tries to twist it and tweak it and make it try to say something. That's why you listen to these guys on television. That'll give you bits and pieces of Scripture to make it say what they wanted to say rather than what it truly says. It says, you believe in God? Good. People tell me, I'll tell, well, I believe in God. Good. Did you know the devil believes in God too? And it freaks him out. Jeff's interpretation. Why? Because he knows the word of God is true. And one day he is going to be condemned for all eternity. And he knows it. Well, well why does he do it? Well, he wants to take as many folks with him as he can. He didn't want to be a, by himself in hell. He wants as many folks to come with him as he can. Tremble at the word. Jesus was casting out some demons, and he showed up this guy that was possessed, and the demons cry out, and look what they say. What do you want with us, son of God? Even the demons knew who Jesus was. They shouted, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? They knew exactly what their future holds, and it scared them to death. And then Jesus threw them in a bunch of pigs. and Well, you know what happened? Those pigs ran off in the water, and I just found out through that scripture that pigs can't swim. The Bible says the demon, I'm kidding. Pig, I guess pigs, I don't know. Pigs taste good. That's all I know. <laughs> Nonetheless. Demonic face trembling. You believe in God? Good. The devil does too. And he trembles because he knows what his future holds. There is dead faith. There is demonic faith. Number three. There is dynamic faith. Dynamic faith. Look what it says in verse 20. It says, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? It says, you want me to prove to you that faith without action is, is, is a waste of time? And then he, again, he's talking to the Jewish people that are in the church. They're, they're saved. They, they, they've fought, they believe Christ. They're following Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But they've jettisoned the idea of acting on that faith, on that what they have as, as that salvation. He says, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You remember the story about that? God says, I want you, Abraham, to sacrifice your one and only son, the son that you love. That's Old Testament teaching, of course, giving us a foretaste of what God says, for God so loved his son 
that he was going to sacrifice him. That son that you have, that your one and only son, that son that you love, I want you to go and I want you to sacrifice him on an altar. And the Bible says Abraham took him all the way to that altar, put him on the altar. And he was probably an adult male at the time. Had him on the altar, had a knife to his throat, and God says, that's enough. There's a ram over there in the bushes. Go ahead and sacrifice that one. You have followed through faithfully. James points it out. Wasn't that considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. I am a friend of God. I am a we sing that song in the church. It comes right from there. Dynamic faith. Someone said the mind understands the truth, the heart desires the truth, and the will acts on the truth. Rabbi Simlai, Simlai, if I said that correctly, in the third century, notice that Moses gave us 613 commands, 365 prohibitions. I always think about 365 days a year, so there's 365 things in the law of Moses that we're not supposed to do, 248 positive commands. I could be wrong on this, but I thought there was 248 bones in the Bible. Don't quote me on that. Maybe it's a squirrel. I'm not sure. But nevertheless, that was a joke. But anyway, so, so there's 365 prohibitions, negative commands. In other words, things you're not supposed to do. And 248 positive commands. Moses gave, gave us those. David in Psalm 15 reduced them down to 11. Isaiah, in Isaiah 33, verses 14 and 15, brought them down to 6. Micah chapter 6, 8 binds them into 3. And Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, reduces them all down to 1. Namely, the just will live by faith. We see that in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and Galatians 3, 11. All those are repeated in there. Christianity is not faith or works. It is, it is faith expressed through works. We call that faith in action. Dynamic faith. What is it? It is the expression of faith in action. Abraham acted on the command of God and, and fulfilled that. And God says, you did well, Abraham. He said it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. Now, Jesus hadn't come on the picture yet. But Abraham was a man of faith, and he trusted God, and he took God as word, and he knew God would provide, and God did exactly that on that mountain. Because once he provided the ram, after they built an altar, and they said, the Lord provides. He knew that God was going to provide. Abraham Lincoln said this, faith is to believe what we do not see, like 11, Hebrews 11, 1, I just referenced Faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of this faith is to see what we believe. Last week I shared with you about how Abraham believed. He went and prayed, and he believed that, that they were going to win that battle of Gettysburg, and he was totally at peace, and, and, his, and his generals found peace in that as well. Because God told Abraham Lincoln, you're going to be successful. Expressing that faith in action. Be believing that it's going to happen, but then acting on it. I give you a couple of examples. Well, uh, just to reference this again, Genesis 15, 6, Abraham be Abram believed the Lord and was credited to him as righteousness. That's what he's referring to right there. But also Genesis 22, verse 12, when, when, uh, when uh, Abraham's there and he laying down, I got kind of ahead of myself on here. Oh, wait, it's not there. It's not there. Oh, no. Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. Do not lay a hand on the boy, God said, when Abraham was on the, or when, when Isaac was on the altar. Do not do anything to him, for I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Real faith is expressed by action. And sometimes that action is going to seem illogical. I've had people say, you know, Pastor, I really couldn't afford to do this particular thing, but God told me to do it, and I, I, I just had to do it. And then they come back later on and say, you know, and God blessed that. Now listen, you don't give to get. Anyone that gives to get, you're not going to get, okay? And if you give thinking somehow you're going to get a pat on the back and, oh, you're such a great, wonderful Christian, I guess if you're doing it for the wrong reasons. But to 
But to have a heart to utilize whatever resource that is. Some of you got gr- a lot of time. And that time is a great resource that you can use by investing in the lives of others. Some of you have got great wealth. And you have the ability to, and I say, <laughs> oh, you, you want to give me, you want me to give to the church. Yeah, if you want to give to Four Winds, great. But I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you have resources at your beck and call that you can invest in the lives of others. So you have talents that are sitting idle and not being used by the Lord. You see, if you say you have faith and don't put it in action, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. Dynamic faith is an expression of faith Expression of uh, faith in action. Of course, we see that Abraham is called a friend of God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, and in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, why was, he done, why was he called a friend of God? Because of his obedience. He took God at his word. I have so many people in my life that just want to argue about the Bible. What a waste of time. I don't, I can't explain all the things that are in here. I, I, I try, man. I try to understand it. Some things I just don't. The fact of the matter is, is we spend more time arguing about the Bible than listening to the Bible. And that's the wrong spirit that we're supposed to have. Jesus himself says, you are my friend if you do what I command you. That's pretty straightforward too, isn't it? Hmm. Dynamic faith, expression of faith through action. Then it goes on and talks about another person here in this particular text. He says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not faith alone. Verse 25, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? What? A prostitute? Regarded as righteous in the eyes of God. That's back in Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 24, if you want to look that story up. But she was remembered not by her profession, but by her provision. She trusted God. And God blessed her. And she goes down through the annals of time, not being regard, not, not as being the prostitute, but the obedient child of God. Verse 26 says, the body without the spirit is dead, so, spe- so faith without deeds is dead. Not only is an expression of faith, but we also have an expectation of faith in action. God expects it. Rahab was used by God. Her reputation was horrible. She was never somebody that anyone would have regarded as, as anything more than just an item just a, a, something to be used. And then God says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use her in a mighty way. There's an expectation of faith in action for every one of us. Look what the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10. The Bible says you and I are God's workmanship. We were created by God. We were created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. The expression of faith through action, but also the expectation. We were created to serve people around us. He said, Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. And you see that verse all the time in one of my messages. I'm going to keep throwing it out there until we start taking it seriously. There's an expectation. God created us for work that he prepared for us in advance to do. Before the creation of the world, God set Paul in for a guitar player here at Four Winds Church. Think about that one for a second. Okay? Paul going to play in Carnegie Hall? Well, maybe he will someday. But the fact of the matter is he wasn't called to play in Carnegie Hall. He was prepared in advance by God. Well, you've been playing guitar, what, six years? Six years. And I'm not trying to brag on you. I just, you just have to be the closest target, okay? I'll use you as a bad example some other time down the road, okay? Okay, I'm just kidding. Before the creation of the world, 
He was going to put a guitar in his hand six years ago, and six years later he's going to be playing in front of a church. Did you think he'd be playing in a church six years ago? No. Why? Because he acted on faith. And every one of us has some kind of expectation from God of a service that he prepared for us in advance to do. You like my shirt? Thanks. Yeah, I, I kind of like this too. A lady that's associated with the church, I've known her probably 10 or 15 years. She's, she's, uh, her husband's been very sick, and she wants so much to come and be a part of this church. She wants so much to come and serve here, and she really wants to do it. And yet, I said, you've got a ministry. You embroider shirts. That's a ministry. Prepared for an advance to do by faith in Jesus Christ. You have no idea what God may be wanting out of you. He expects it. Your time, your talents, your treasures. Just have to take them up on it. I got one more verse, and we're going to close up here. Tight, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. Jesus says, you know what? By the fruit, you'll, re you'll recognize a person of faith by, the, by their actions, by the things that they do. A good tree pr pr produces good fruit, right? A bad tree produces bad fruit. You will know them by their fruit. One more. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear what? Much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. The facets of faith are pretty simple. You've got dead faith. You've got demonic faith. Or then for the child of God, you've got dynamic faith. Friends, I don't know about you. My faith, I want my faith to be dynamic every single day. I found a wonderful story, and, I want to share, and I'm going to read it to you. It's, I, 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 I tried to summarize it. I don't like the way when I summarize it, so I'm actually going to read it to you. This was, brought, this was something I read just recently by a pastor, Ralph Neighbor. He's from a, a pastor from Houston's West Memorial Baptist Church. And he writes this, and I quote, Jack had been a president of a large corporation, and when he got cancer, they ruth ruthlessly dumped him. He went through his insurance, used his life savings, and had, pra and had practically nothing left. I visited with one of my deacons. So this is Pastor Neighbor with one of his deacons going to visit Jack. He says, I visited him with one of my deacons who said, Jack, you speak so openly about the, br the brief life you have left. I wondered if you've prepared for your life after death. Jack stood up, vivid with rage. You, blank, 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 Christians. All you think about is what's going to happen to me after I die. If your God was so great, why doesn't He do something about the real problems of life? And then he went on to tell us that he was leaving his wife penniless and his daughter without money for college. And then he ordered us out. Later, the pastor said, my deacon insisted that we go back. And we did. Jack, he said, I know I offended you. And I humbly apologize. But I want you to know that I've been working since then. Your first problem was where your family will live after you die. A realtor in our church has agreed to sell your house and give your wife his commission. I guarantee you that if you'll permit us, others, uh, uh, some other men and I will make the house payments until it is sold. He said, then I've contacted the owner of an apartment house down the street. He offered your wife a three-bedroom apartment plus free utilities and an $850 a month salary in return for her, uh, for her collecting rents and supervising plumbing and electrical prayers. In other words, she'd be a manager of that place. He'd give her a place to live. The income from your house should pay your daughter's college. I just wanted you to know. I just wanted you to know that your family will be cared for. <clears throat> Jack cried like a baby. 
But he died shortly thereafter. He was all wrapped up in pain, and unfortunately, he never accepted Christ. But he experienced God's love even while rejecting him. And his widow, touched by the caring Christian love that she experienced, she responded to the gospel and got saved. You see, here was a guy that said, oh, you got to get saved. And that wasn't the first thing on his mind. He was going to leave his family with nothing. And so the deacon said, you know, we got to do something about that. And he went, and, and I, I share that story with you, not bragging for the deacon. The deacon didn't stand in front of the church and give a testimony about all he had done. He told that to Jack. And even though Jack didn't receive, his wife did. Changed her life forever. Facets of faith. Dead faith. No deeds. Demonic faith. Believe in God. Or believe God exists, but don't put your faith in Him. And dynamic faces, let me put my faith in my actions working together. That's why at the bottom of your outline I put this particular text. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Friends, what facet of faith do you possess? And what do you desire? That's the question. Let's pray together. Father God, it's in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. You have told us that even though the body without the Spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. God, I know that I've been to many funerals and I look in that casket and that person looks fine. They look okay. They, they, they look like they could get right up out of that casket and walk across, the, walk across the road. But if I put my fingers on their neck and didn't find a pulse, if I put a, 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 a mirror underneath their nose, I wouldn't see any breath. Why? Because they're dead. They may look good on the outside, but the inside is lifeless. And Father, tonight we want to make sure that we're not going to walk out of here with a dead faith. That we're going to dedicate ourselves. Search us, O oh God, that you would know our hearts. Christmas is a time of giving. We spend money we don't have to impress people we don't like and expect something and a satisfaction in that. God, help us tonight to have a dynamic faith that not only says, yes, Lord, but says, here I am, send me. That's my prayer, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, I never cease to be amazed on how God is working here at Four Winds Church. We're seeing so many amazing things take place. Lives being changed, families being restored, financial situations being repaired, Bible studies changing and, and, and starting all the time. It's an amazing time to be a part of the church. If you have a church home, well, good for you. But if not, come check out Four Winds Church. We'd love to see you sometime soon. You can get information from fourwindslove.org. That's fourwindslove.org. Thanks for tuning in. God bless.